Let's do it. Well, I think just to kick things off, I'd love it if you could introduce yourself and give the audience a little bit of background into you and how you ended up doing what you're doing now. Okay. Uh, My name is Shelly Bierman. I am an artist manager, a fine art advisor, um, and a fine art appraiser. Um, I grew up in a small town in South Florida, um, and my high school had an internship class. And I got an internship, um, and kind of the idea is you get an internship at a local business. And so one of my mom's clients at the time was an art gallery. And so she suggested I sort of pop in and say, hey, do you need some uh, free labor for a few months? And uh, that was in exchange for class credits. And so working at that art gallery in high school was my first ever experience in the art industry and in the art market. And I thought it was absolutely fascinating and interesting and unbelievably glamorous, um, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And so that was my first really foray into the the art market. And then I went on to college um, in Miami and studied finance and marketing and sort of always had this love of art, but I always knew I would be on the business side of things. And so I got a a, um, a minor in art history and then eventually went on to study art business at Sotheby's Institute of Art in New York City. Um, And that was a wonderful program. And so I started my career in New York, which was fantastic. Um, Did uh, art insurance there, moved to Atlanta. I've worked in several galleries um, and my work in galleries sort of led me to believe, it it sort of made me realize that as much as I loved working with collectors and helping collectors put art in their homes, I felt like I had a lot more to offer to artists because they would sort of come in and they didn't have anywhere to turn for basic business advice. And so they might ask their galleries, they might ask their artist friends, but there wasn't a real structured environment for an artist to help build their business. And as you and any other artist knows, being an artist is being a small business owner. It's being an entrepreneur. And being those things, the skills you need to to be an entrepreneur can be quite different than the skills you need to be a professional artist um, and to create work every day. And so I worked... Um, I worked for one artist for a while out of her studio, and then eventually I went on to build my own business in which I help artists um, run their business. And so as an artist, you can work with me in a couple different ways. There is the artist consultations, which is one-on-one sort of coaching sessions, and it's kind of, it can be... um, designed in whatever way is most helpful for the artist. If there's a specific opportunity they want to talk about, or sometimes I have clients who just need regular check-ins as they're working towards a deadline or a project. Um, And then sort of the bigger part of my business, which is what I really love is the artist management. And as an artist manager, artist manager, I do everything as far as running a business for the artist so that they can spend time creating. And that includes everything from daily operational tasks like invoicing, client communication, um, marketing, sending emails. And then we also spend a lot of time sort of working on high level um, strategy and goal setting and and, and things like that. And so working with me as a manager is a very, um, I kind of call it a very intense relationship. It's sort of, we, we talk, you know, I talk to my clients pretty much every day. We're talking about the minutia of the of the business, as well as the high level, you know, where are we going to go next? What are our goals for this year and next year in the future? Yeah, I think that's great. And I love the kind of different tiered offerings that you, you have for artists kind of meeting Mm -hmm. them where they are, but you touched on this slightly, but I'd love to learn more about how does that advisor role work and how do you stay in contact with your clients? You say you talk every day, but like, Mm -hmm. do they come to you with questions? Do you kind of lead that conversation? How does that relationship Mm -hmm. work if artists are interested in learning more about it? Um, it, it can be any, you can communicate with me in any possible way. Um, (laughs) some of my clients I talk to on the phone, some of them, we only text. I have some clients who I've been working with for years and we've only texted for years and I might see them. I do try to see my clients in person, um, as much as I can, but I only have one client who lives in the same town as me. So usually I'm only traveling if they have a opening or, a um, an event going on or something. 
Um, so it can be text, it can be phone and it, and it goes both ways. Sometimes I might reach out and say, Hey, you know, you're working on this new body of work. Let's send an email blast today. Or they might say, you know, Hey, Shelly, I have all this new work. Can you get it up on the website or can you add it to the database system? Um, so, and then a lot of times the emails, I manage the, the email inbox, both for sort of the studio, let's say, and then also for the artists themselves. And so anytime an inquiry comes in, in most cases, I, I can kind of take it and run with it. And, you know, if somebody's asking for a tear sheet or a price list or a commission quote, um, I can usually handle all that on my own without, without really involving the artist. And so with that, there is, so, you know, and sometimes this, this just kind of takes a little bit of time. Um, but eventually there is a, there's a deep level of trust that my clients put in me in the, in the sense that, you know, they hire me to run their business and to really level it up. And by way of that, I can kind of just take the business and run with it after a while. And so it's not like every single email I'm asking the artist, like, what do you want to do here? And I'm, and I never just would like forward an email without any context to just be like, you deal with this. I mean, it's, it's pretty much right it's pretty much all res my responsibility. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's great. And I think one question I have building on that is if you have this level of trust, I'm sure you have a great relationship with the artists you do work with. So I'm sure there's, you know, a limit on the number of artists you work with for that reason. Mm -hmm. So you can have yep. that bond. Mm -hmm. When would you say sort of a two-part question, when would you say an artist is ready to work with someone like you, like at what mm -hmm. stage in their career? And then also how do you make sure you're working with people that are a good you know, personality fit to put it lightly for you yeah. so that y'all can work well together. Yeah. And that's a really good question because sometimes the personality fit is more important than the actual need. Mm -hmm. Um, because you, you do need to put a, a, a large amount of trust in me and, you know, anybody, any prospect is always welcome to talk to my current clients and, you know, I can give you referrals and all of that. Um, but the end, at the end of the day, you do need to feel comfortable with me and, and my process and my, you know, my proven results. And, you know, you can see kind of what I've done with my other clients. Um, so you're right. There is, there is a personality, um, there's a personality compatibility that must exist before I can take on a new client. And there are artists who, you know, I could tell upfront would not be a good fit. And that might mean I could feel like they were going to micromanage me or on the other end, I could tell, you know, they might just kind of disappear for long periods of time and I wouldn't get what I need. Mm -hmm. um, because while, while I can handle a lot of the business myself as an artist, you do need to be available to me to sort of, you know, if I need something, I need to be able to get it from you. Um, and um, what was the first part of your question? Oh, what, at what point does an artist need a manager? I was like, I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I started with the second part. Um, when an artist gets to a point where they are spending more time running a business than actually making work, then that is a good time to consider hiring a manager. Sometimes when an artist gets to that point, they might hire a studio assistant. And a studio assistant is incredibly beneficial if you need help actually making the work. Um, whereas I don't do that. I do not, I don't even go to most of my clients' studios. And I always tell my clients, I'm not an artist. I cannot help you make the art. It is not, that is not part of my skill set. And so sometimes what an artist actually needs, you know, is not a studio assistant, but they really need somebody who is actually operating the business and laying the foundation for running the business long term and increasing efficiencies, putting processes into place, um, you know, forming a database, updating the website. I mean, sometimes I'll come in and, you know, website, you know, CV hasn't been updated in five years or something. And, and those are just little tiny details that become a burden perhaps to an artist, but are actually still very important to being a professional artist and to running a successful artist business. Yeah. I love that because I think a lot of artists, they reach that point of need. And I do think a lot of people lean on a studio assistant, which can be great if that's what your trouble spot is. But I right. think it's mm -hmm. so much better to hire people that fill or a person or people that fill the gaps of what mm -hmm. you 
aren't as good at, or, mm -hmm. you know, it's like hire the expert in the areas where you're not an expert. And so exactly. a studio assistant's great because it can save you time, which yeah. is, you know, obviously beneficial if that's what you mm -hmm. need. But also I love what you're doing because I mean, I'm already thinking of <laughs> if I order your work with you, everything, like I haven't updated my CV in years, but it's, right, right. it's stuff like, you know, you just probably know mm -hmm. the marketing side and the business side. And a lot of artists, yeah, yeah you know, we're figuring it out as they go, but that might not be their area of expertise. And so I think that's such mm -hmm. a great offering and something more artists should think about too. Definitely. And I think that's where hiring somebody like me, like I said, I've always been on the business side of mm -hmm. art. I've never, I've never been on the creative side as much as I adore art. I collect art. I surround myself with art. I am not an artist. And so my skill set compliments my clients really well. And so that leads, you know, we're never stepping on each other's toes. And mm -hmm. sometimes clients, sometimes artists do need help with the creative side. Like maybe they're stuck on a piece or they don't know where to go next or, you know, how to evolve their business. And I can advise them from a business perspective, mm -hmm. but in terms of, you know, creative consultations, let's say that is not something that I would I'm not going to be your best resource for that. I do have resources for that if you would like to hire somebody else. And that's another thing I maintain for my clients is a trusted vendor list of people I've worked with before. And I have a list of, um, you know, content writers, web designers, shippers, installers. And I maintain that list in, in many different cities so that if a client does need a an installer or a framer in a different city, um, I have all that on hand. Or if somebody needs help, you know, rewriting their bio or their artist um, statement, I have all that on hand. And just having that list of resources also increases efficiency across all my clients because it's already there. It's already proven. I've already worked with these people and I know who to call. Yeah. And I love that, that specific phrase of increasing efficiency, because that is what so many artists need. I mean, I think the biggest pain point for so many artists is getting back in the studio. It's like all of a sudden you start selling, you're seeing the progress, it's exciting. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not painting anymore, which if you're not exactly. painting or creating, mm -hmm. you can't sell. And so it's kind of this hard cycle. And I love that you're coming in and really helping with that. One mm -hmm. question I have is, you know, if I were to, if I just started with you, we're working together, mm -hmm. do you do some kind of audit and like look through what I need mm -hmm. help with? Is it a discussion based? Is it mm -hmm. you kind of point out what you think I need help with or how does that mm -hmm. process work? Yeah. And I think I never call it an audit, but I think that's a good way to put it. Um, you know, yeah, I'll look at your Instagram. I'll look at your, um, your web presence and I will sort of advise where I think we can do better. And then sometimes I'll even come in and we'll do sort of a gallery audit and we'll take a look at all the galleries you're working with and see who is no longer, you know, serving you, or maybe somebody you've outgrown, or maybe you want to, you know, find a different market and, and approach galleries in a different city. Um, so I, yes, I will do an audit of the overall business and that includes both internally and externally. And we will kind of decide together how to move forward and where to go. And, and, you know, like I said, sometimes a gallery might no longer be a good fit. And so we, we, you know, make the decision to, to kind of move on and that happens occasionally. However, all of my clients, all my clients do have gallery partnerships and they all sell out of their studio. And so sometimes we sort of make a decision about where I kind of call them, you know, different revenue buckets, you know, maybe we want to will we want to work on the revenue bucket? That's the studio sales. Or maybe we want to work on the revenue bucket. That's commissions. Or maybe we want to work on the revenue bucket. That's prints or passive income. And so that's all areas that we, you know, I'll sort of do my own look and then I'll, I'll talk to the client as well. And, and some, some clients, you know, don't, don't necessarily know what they want until they really sit down and think about it. And they say, oh, actually I do want to be in more galleries or I want to be in less galleries or I'm stretched so thin already between all my galleries. I can't, you know, I can't give them what they need. Um, so we'll, so I will go through kind of on my own and then in conjunction with the artist to decide how best to move forward. Um, and then in, ad in addition to that internally, and again, increasing efficiency, I will put systems and processes into place um, to just keep the business running smoothly and, and keeping it efficient, you know, long-term. Yeah. I love that. When doing these audits or mm -hmm. if that's what we're going to refer to them as, yeah, that's great. are there certain, um, it's a very corporate -y term, but mm -hmm. are there certain mistakes or not even mistakes, like stumbling blocks or bottlenecks that you continually see coming up for artists? I know obviously every situation is different, but is there anything just a takeaway that you're like, I see a lot of artists running into this problem. Yes. And I would say the biggest stumbling block, 
I see. And one of the things when I do these so-called audits is I'll go back through emails and DMs and see where there are missed opportunities. Maybe somebody reached out and the artist just didn't respond. And that is probably the biggest stumbling block I see fairly consistently is that an email might, might come through, you know, asking for a price or asking for a commission quote, or even asking if you're taking commissions or asking for, you know, what's available. And, you know, I don't know if the artist just didn't have the information readily available or if they saw it and then forgot or just the amount of missed opportunities I see is really can be really troubling because I worry that that happens over and over and over and artists are missing out on opportunities simply because they didn't have a price list ready or simply because they didn't know the answer to the question. And so, yeah, during these sort of initial audits, I will go back and see, you know, where there was a missed opportunity. And it's a good opportunity for me to say something like, hey, so-and-so just hired me as their manager. I'm going back through open emails, open inquiries, and wanted to check back in. So it's a really good time to um, to have a touch point with, with those potential clients yeah. and collectors. I think that's great. And I'm sure that's something so many artists are hearing that and being like, I relate. And there's probably a lot of things that fall through the crack. When, you, when you're when you doing it all on your own, just things yeah. fall through the crack. Cracks yeah. Just yeah. And, and when you have, and when you have somebody who you hire where that is their job, you know, like me, that is my job is to make sure every inquiry is answered. Every person who wants a price list gets a price list. And it's, it's to some people that might seem very simple and obvious, but yeah, when you're wearing all the hats as an artist and as an artist, you are not sitting in front of your computer, most likely waiting for emails to come in, you know, you're in your studio, you're painting, you're in the zone. And, you know, even if you think you're going to spend an hour at the end of every day answering emails, you might be in the flow and you might just work through that hour. And then, right. you know, that your time gets, gets compressed. Right. And I know we, I've talked to some of the artists you work with. I know some of the people you work with are also have other responsibilities personally as like mm -hmm. mothers or, you know, they yeah. have other things that are also taking their time. Yeah. How do you mm -hmm. communicate? Cause I know specifically, like if someone's a mom or just life mm -hmm. changes, like I'm sure a lot of the mm -hmm. ways you work together pivot, like I want to be in more galleries. I want to be in less, yeah. more time, mm -hmm. less time. How do you navigate those changes just in their lives as well? Mm -hmm. It does. And that happens a lot. And that's, um, what you said, you know, a lot of my clients are moms and by virtue of that, and as a mom myself, I have two young girls, you know, our, our time as moms and especially as working moms, our time working is very valuable just as much as our time with our kids is very valuable. And there are these boundaries and these sort of start and end times to our days. And so when we're working, you know, we are we are working that that is very valuable time and we make the most of it. And then kind of outside those working hours, I always tell my clients, like I am available to you pretty much all that. You can always send me a text. If I can respond, I will respond. If I'm, you know, in the throes of bath time and bedtime, like I'll talk to you either after, you know, after my kids go to bed or we'll pick it up tomorrow. And of, you know, that is, there is just this intense mutual respect between me and my clients and, and really just a respect for each other's time. And that is such a valuable part of my business. And working with moms was, you know, it wasn't my intention and it certainly is not a prerequisite. Not all of my clients are moms, um, but it does sort of build this really deep level of respect and trust. And, and, and that has become a really special part of my business. Yeah. I think that's, really, at, go ahead. I think that's important. Sorry, and as you say, their, their, their lives and my life does continue to change and, you know, personally, but, but of course also business-wise, um, the business changes and evolves. And most of my clients I've been working with for years. And so the priorities for them when we first started out might be different from the priorities that we have now. And when we first start out, I send a scope of work and it's a bullet point list of, the tasks that I will handle. And I always say this is not all encompassing, but it's a good start. Um, and of course, things will come up over the years that will change and the priorities for an artist will change. You know, for example, one of my clients right now, I'm putting together um, submissions for artist residencies and we're sending that out. And two years ago when we started, that was not a priority, but it is now. And so it's it's very rare that I will say something like, oh, well, that's not my job. and mm -hmm. If, if I do feel that way, if I feel like an artist asks me to do something that's outside my skill set, 
I will try to go find somebody who can do it. And then we can decide together if that's something we want to further outsource. Yeah. And I think that's great. And I think meeting, I mean, obviously you're coming from, you have your own changes and you're probably dealing with pivots and just Mm -hmm. understanding that in your clients that you're not rigid, you're not stuck in one way, you're meeting them where they are. I think that's so important because art is so personal. And so I think having this understanding of when you're working for yourself, there's so many things that come up and just being able to meet them and help them through that and navigate that, I think is Mm -hmm. such a benefit to what you're doing. It is. And, and I also have to realize, you know, being, being where I sit as the business person, so to speak, you know, I, as we all do, we go through ebbs and flows in our, in our lives and times we're feeling really motivated and times we're not. And, you know, I can always sort of, even if I'm sort of not feeling motivated to do so, I will always be able to sort of sit down at my computer and, and get through emails and sort of do the things I need to do. As an artist, I've worked with artists directly and sort of in this you know, sort of intimate relationship for so long that I also know that an artist who does not feel inspired to work really can't produce their best work. And I encourage my clients to always go in and at least do something, even if you don't plan to sell it or show it or anything. I do think sort of the practice of creating is still really important and you never know what will come from that. But I also know that as an artist, you do you do need the space and the time to kind of get the juices flowing and get into it. And you can't, you really can't force it. And you can tell, I can tell, and I think collectors can sometimes tell when an artist is being forced to create a piece that they don't feel inspired to create. And it's not, it's just not their best work. And so I also try to give them the space and the time to um to be free and to and to sort of feel inspired when they do. That's such an important reminder. And I'm sure it's so valuable to have you as a sounding board, just reminding them, you know, you, some stuff you just can't force. That's where, that's where being an artist is so different than other careers. It's not Mm -hmm. like you can just show up and crank out the, the writing or the email or whatever it is. It's like, you really have to be inspired to be able Mm -hmm. to create the way you need to create. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, an artist might be going through something personally and they just, they just don't, they, they can't go in and produce their best work. And Um, and I respect that, you know, I'm not an artist. And so, you know, like I always say, I don't know what it's like to be an artist, but I can respect their feelings and their, their need for time. And sometimes their need for space as well. What are your thoughts on artists pivoting style or type of work? So if an artist comes Mm -hmm. to you and they've been really successful in sort of one lane, let's say, this is kind of Mm -hmm. an ambiguous way of thinking about it, but if they've been really successful in one lane and they're like, I'm just not inspired anymore. I really want to go more in this direction. How do you help them navigate that? And what can that look like when you're just kind of creatively ready to go a different way? Mm -hmm. And I always encourage my clients to have a variety of work that they offer. And I do think there are a lot of artists out there who have become successful in one type of work and then that's all they make and then that's all they can sell and then they're uninspired and then they don't want to make that anymore. And and then, but then maybe that's all people want to buy, but then, it, you know, it's sort of like a snowball effect and then the market becomes oversaturated with this one type of work. And um, so being able to pivot And that's also a matter of creating a really deep connection with your collectors in a sense that they will, they will go where you go. And what I love about most of my clients do, you know, while they all have gallery relationships, they also maintain close contact with their own collectors that they've developed and cultivated on their own over the years. And by doing that, you know, you build a deeper connection with your buyers and ideally they will collect you know, even if you create a new body work or a new style, they will collect that as well because it's by you as an artist. And a lot of times, you know, as a collector myself, I buy artists who I know and appreciate and want to support. And, you know, if an artist makes something new and a new style of work, I think that's amazing. I think that's awesome. And and I, I do think it's probably hard as an artist to create a consistent through line between all your bodies of work. But I think good artists do that really seamlessly and they can evolve throughout their entire career um, in a way that makes it obviously by that artist, even maybe it's a different style or a different subject matter. Yeah. And I, I agree that I support artists who I believe in, who I followed mm-hmm. for a long time. 
who I just tune into, even if they do change. So I think mm-hmm. that concept of having different bodies of work is so important just to avoid mm-hmm. burnout or boredom right. or a saturated market. Yeah, exactly. But mm-hmm. from your perspective, something you said was that, you know, you mentioned like you love supporting artists that you really mm-hmm. connect with. Mm-hmm. How do you think about creating that connection with the artists and their clients and their, you know, audience Mm -hmm. from a marketing perspective and from a business perspective, like with what you do, how do you talk artists through that? Like that it's important for the connection beyond just the artwork being beautiful. Yeah. And something context is something I always talk about with my clients. And if you work with me, you will hear me say the same things over and over because they're things I really believe in. And in terms of marketing, um, this is just, this is a small, a small thing, but I think it's really important. And my clients will laugh when they listen to this. Um, having thoughtful titles, I think is very important. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a couple of clients who are cringing right now because they kill me every time I, I say that, <laughs> but having a good thoughtful title is, I consider it like a marketing tool. You know, I mean, it's, it can provide so much more context to a piece. It can create a deeper connection to a piece by a collector. Um, I've had, I've had, you know, collectors buy a painting because of the title, because the title spoke to them just as much as the painting did. And, you know, I think having a untitled is just, it's a missed opportunity. And in addition to that, something I tell all my clients, I'm I'm encouraging everybody to do, particularly in this sort of post-pandemic society we're we're living in, is to do as much as possible in person. I think we've all been behind our screens for so long and, um, there is no greater way to build a deep relationship with your collectors than seeing them in person and talking to them in person. I mean, talking to, and, and not just your collectors, but also, you know, somebody like a designer or an art consultant and being in person with the people who are buying your work or proposing your work to their clients there's no greater way to build a connection with them than to do it in person. And, you know, we're all on screens. We do everything digitally. We do everything virtually. Um, but actually putting in the work and going in person, if, if, if a gallery is having an opening for you, if at all humanly possible, go, even if you have to get on a plane and, you know, go for 24 hours, go and meet your, you know, build that deeper connection, not only with your collectors, but also with that gallery and to put in the effort to be there in person. And I know a lot of artists may not want to, you know, be in those types of social settings, but it really does build a a much deeper long-term connection with your buyers. I love that advice. And I think it's so true, especially, I mean, now more than ever coming out of yeah. Mm-hmm. COVID where we did get comfortable behind our screens. And I think there right. was a lot of, you know, benefits that came from that. And I think obviously technology can be wonderful, but I think mm-hmm. the true connection when you meet people in person, your community, other artists, you know, mm-hmm. advisors, clientele, like all of that, it just really is such a, such a m- more solid bond. And so mm-hmm. people, I mean, word of mouth is still there. Like people want right. to support people they know, or they feel like they know. So I love that. And then I also yeah. have never heard the title advice before. <laughs> and it's so true. I mean, I love it. I think that's, yeah. I definitely have had some titles speak to me before. Right. And I think that's a great, just little tidbit takeaway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I, I, and I think that also just adds to the creativity of artists. I mean, the, some of the titles they come up with, I think are amazing and thoughtful and hilarious and um and it yeah it does it just builds a deeper connection and provides more context to the piece itself definitely I'd love to ask if an artist is newer maybe they're kind of just in the beginning phases of their career you have so much wisdom and knowledge and business expertise kind of because you've worked with artists at different stages what would you say is just one thing artists can think about or do just to grow their business strategically from the get-go. It's like, what mistakes do you see being made that maybe artists can just bypass? (laughs) Mm -hmm. So day one, when I come into an artist's business, literally day one, I set up their database system. And so if as a new artist, you can start that as you're just starting out, I can't even tell you how much more efficiency you will have than if you don't have the database system. And I know that sounds sort of 
very businessy and very, mm-hmm. but I, I can't tell you how useful it is when somebody asks for a price list or a tear sheet and you can do it in a matter of seconds. And the more you, the earlier you put that in place, the easier it's going to be. And the more professional you'll seem throughout your career, the faster, you know, if you're not at a point where you can hire a manager or a, you know, somebody to help you, the faster you can respond to emails, the quicker you can, you know, get people what they need and the less opportunities you'll miss out on. Um, So if I could give new artists one piece of advice, I would say set up a database system from day one. And that means, you know, put the image, the size, the price, you know, hope eventually who it's sold to. And, you know, and then if somebody wants a, a price list or a catalog of your work, you can pull it in seconds and you're not trying to make a new PDF and then some pieces sold. So here's a, you know, here's a price list, but numbers five, six, and seven are sold or, you know, it's, it, it right. just makes it much more professional and easier to do business with you. And again, I feel like I keep saying this over and over, but it'll just increase the efficiency of your business um, you know, long-term. Yeah. Do you have a specific system you recommend or, or do you use Excel? Do you use, I mean, what typically (laughs) would you lean on? I I've been fortunate that I don't know if this is, I've been fortunate because I can put my own system in place, Mm -hmm. but most of my clients have not had a system when I started working with them, or maybe they had kind of an Excel sheet or things were kind of here and there. Um, I personally use Art Cloud, which I mm-hmm. love, and that's an Atlanta-based company. And um, you know, I know the founder, and so I get really good customer service with them. And I know the program. I have every every one of my clients is up on Art Cloud. I use that one all the time. Um, Artwork Archive is another one I've heard of that I know people like, and there's several others out there. Um, I just use the one that I know best, and I know if I have a problem, I can contact them and get the answer I need. And I as a small business owner, I put a lot of value on other businesses I work with where I can get good customer service. And I know if I have a problem, I can get an answer very, very quickly. Um, and also through Art Cloud, I can I send all my invoices through there, all of my clients' invoices. And so that also just helps the efficiency. You know, I can just do in, in a couple of clicks, I can get an invoice out in a matter of seconds and they can pay right through the system. Um, so as much as you can do in one place, the easier it's going to be to, um, you know, to get your clients what they need. So yeah, I think having a database system is, it's so important as an artist, that's probably not something you think about, but, and then down the road, you know, think about it from a legacy perspective, you would, you would like to have a record of everything you've ever made, um, and be able to know eventually who it sold to. And, you know, that's going to be the easiest way to just main, just have that record keeping. Yeah. I think it's so important. And I think that's a, another pain point for artists is just mm-hmm. kind of inventory management organization yeah. dealing with all of that. And I think if you can get a system in place, like you said, from the get go, it's going to take away so much headache. And especially I always tell artists this, like if you show up professionally, people are going to mm-hmm. take you seriously, no matter what phase of your career you're in, how many followers you have. Like, it's like, if you show up as a professional, people will treat you as one. And that's a really easy takeaway Mm -hmm. and tip that people can, I think, implement today, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, it's incredibly important. And it just, it does make you seem more professional, um, as an artist and, um, and then you, you know, you have record of your, your pricing and, and everything else. Definitely. Well, what do you see next for your business? Where are you hoping to grow? What are you hoping, mm-hmm. you know, to come with all of this? Mm-hmm. What is on the horizon and in the future? Um, it's a good question. It's something I think about all the time. The way I set up my business in the way that my clients and I work, it's not entirely scalable because mm-hmm. it does involve me talking to my clients almost every day and sort of having that touch point. And you know, like you said earlier, I mean, I can only take on so many clients just because of the way that I've built the business. And, you know, I do, like I said, I do take on those artist consultations and the main difference, the consultations are great because I can help more artists, but the main difference is that in one of the consultations, which is usually 30 minutes or 60 minutes, I will tell you what I think you should do. And I can tell you what, you know, what inventory management system I think you should use or how to, I could sort of do an audit as well and tell you where you should, uh, you know, edit your website or things like that. With the management, I actually do all those things for you. And that's kind of the main difference between those two 
um, roles that I have. So in terms of scaling, it's, it's, I love my clients. I feel so deeply connected to them and, and I wake up every day being so grateful that I am able to play a small role in their, in their um, lives and their careers. And I sort of decided at some point that I would rather make a very meaningful difference in the lives of fewer people than, you know, sort of very briefly touch the masses, if you will. Yeah. Um, and, and so if I, so if I go the rest of my career having, you know, my, my handful of artists that I help daily and feel like I'm really helping them and helping them live better lives and be better artists and be more successful, ultimately, I'm perfectly fine with that. Yeah. I mean, going deep versus wide. And I think right. you're making mm -hmm. such an impact with the people you're working with. And I mean, I think it's, it shows, I mean, just looking if people look at the names of some of the artists you work with, you mm -hmm. can see their success. I mean, they have mm -hmm. such strand, strong brand images and gallery partnerships and all of that yeah. great stuff. So I love that. And I think mm -hmm. that's a really great takeaway too, especially in the art world. I think, mm -hmm. you know, there's so much people talking about like scalability and growth right. and like sell this course and you'll do, right. you know, X, Y, and Z. And I love right, the like, yeah. can we actually make a difference in one person's life? And like, what can that exactly. look like? And so I think you're doing a great exactly. job of that. Yeah. And I always see those, um, the courses and the workshops and all mm -hmm. those, and I'm always so intrigued by them. And I, I listen to a million podcasts. I'm always listening to those sorts of things. And I kind of think, and I think they're great. I'm sure many of them are very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just not, it's really not been a part of my business model to, to do something like that. So someday I think maybe I'll like teach a course at a college or something. I don't know, something like that maybe, but um, I don't know though to scale my business. I just don't see how it would work. Maybe somebody mm -hmm. can help me someday with that. But yeah. I, I just think, you know, like I said, building those deep relationships with my small amount of clients is more important than scaling. Yeah. I love that. Well, I love to conclude every episode with a takeaway, a lesson, a tip, something beyond what you've already offered that you can just <laughs> share with the audience that will help them, you know, increase efficiency, grow their business, or it could be something personal, like make sure to be happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, that was important. <laughs> any takeaway um, that you would like to share with our audience? Okay. I think one thing that everybody can do today, do one thing to increase your exposure. And that can be either going out to a gallery opening tonight and meeting the gallery owner and meeting some other collectors, maybe some other artists, or it can be, you know, send an email with your new work, or it can just be posting something on Instagram. I think sometimes artists get sort of siloed in their studio and they forget about the larger world and they sort of say, well, why isn't anybody buying my art? And somebody, you know, Maybe nobody knows it's there. You have to, you have to speak for your art. It won't speak for you. And you have to put yourself out there and just gain some exposure. And by gaining exposure, that'll look different for everybody. You know, some people have a really strong social media game. Some people have a really amazing cadence with their newsletters. Some people are always out and about at events. And so you know, if you're really good in one of those areas, maybe try to be better in others. And, you know, there's frequently I'll say something like, oh, well, you know, you're working on this new body work, let's send an email about it, or, you know, maybe make a blog post or post on social media. Or, um, you know, if somebody's having an opening, like if you can at all make it, you know, please try to go or, you know, I'll try to go sometimes. Um, so I would say, you know, increase your exposure and just get yourself out there. I think that's a great tip and, and a great reminder as well. Can you share how everyone can learn more about you, find you, mm -hmm. your different offerings, all of that? Yes. Um, I have a website, uh, beermanartadvisory.com, and that's Beerman, two E's, two N's. Um, and my Instagram is at Beerman Art Advisory. And you can always email me at Shelly at beermanartadvisory.com. Uh, follow me on Instagram. You can connect with me. Anyway, if you see me out at a gallery opening, please say hi. Um, and yeah, I'd love to connect with more of your listeners and, and you know, learn more about um, your audience. <laughs>